primary texts. She does not necessarily assume that you've read the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Aeneid. But in part four, she's going to tell you the story. She's going to draw from lots and lots of different places. And this is what makes Hamilton so important. Because she reads in so many different areas. And she compiles all these different strands of stories. And she reduces them down to wonderful storytelling. Well, let's finish with our final thoughts here for this lecture. And then set up lecture number two. This is really important for us. We need this in our study to be better readers, to be better students, and for, of course this won't shock you when we say this in 303, to be better thinkers. That's ultimately our goal because the questions that are going to be asked in studies of Greek and Roman mythology will be important questions still today, sometimes not so easily answered. Now let's pause for a moment and remind you of something we've said in earlier lectures, the Greeks' view of the world. They had a kind of important dualism that was always in play. The gods who lived on Mount Olympus, we'll have more to say about them in lecture two and following. The gods lived on Mount Olympus, they were defined in two fundamentally important ways. One, they were immortal. They didn't die. Two, they knew things that humans just do not know. They seem to know pretty much everything, okay? Now, this is sometimes in debate, depending on the stories that you're working with, how much of the future does a god know, et cetera, et cetera. But they certainly know way more than humans know. Of course, opposite the gods living up on Mount Olympus are humans. Well, what are humans and how are they defined? Simply, primarily, in two ways. One, well, they're going to die. They're mortal. And two, well, humans barely know anything. I mean, we, we forget what happened 25 minutes ago, and we have virtually no idea about what's going to happen in the future, although we kind of try to predict and the like. Sitting in between these, and obviously the question is, what are humans to do when they are in a situation like this? To the rescue for the Greeks comes the poets. We might actually call them today artists, because sometimes it's not simply going to be poets, but in fact all other forms of art as well. Okay? Well, who are these artist poet types? Well, in Greek thought, they are very important. As we've said in other lectures, they sit kind of in the center. They are special people. They have been born with special gifts. And the gods will inspire. The Greeks actually invent this notion. Inspire. They'll give them ideas. And from the poets then, the Greeks argue, everything else comes. So all of the important ideas, all of the important knowledge that humans have, somehow are derived through these poets, these artists, these deliverers of important information. Which will explain why, for example, even somebody like John Milton, as he's beginning Paradise Lost, a series of comments in our Harvard Classics lectures, for example, What's the first thing that he does? He invokes the muse. Well, what does that mean? Well, he asks the muses, the gods, to help him tell the story. We will see this, of course, in our study of the Iliad, the Odyssey, and, of course, Virgil's Aeneid as well, right? This invocation of the muse. Well, what are the major, major questions, then, that will be resurrected in our study, philosophically speaking? Well, there's at least four, and we'll be concentrating on these four as we go through these stories, so you want these in your notes. We've already mentioned it here a second ago, but maybe without the language, so now let's apply the language. And, of course, these are not new words to us, and hello, we're never afraid of words, and so let's play the game with words. First of all, epistemology. Epistus, from the Greek root meaning to know, knowledge. In other words, the question of epistemology is, what do you know? Socrates will enjoy asking a question like the following. How do you know that you're sitting in this room right now and not actually dreaming? Of course, the Zen Kwon says, I dreamed I was a butterfly and I awoke and wondered, am I a butterfly dreaming I'm a human? In other words, the question of knowledge. Well, we've already said that the Greeks have knowledge humans don't have. How much do you actually know? The Greeks will constantly point out bloody little. And that's what gets, of course, humans in all kinds of problems, right? We assume we know things about somebody and we were wrong. Number two, if epistemology has to do with what we know, ontology has to do with who we are. As we've already pointed out, for example, the gods are immortal. You can't kill a god. But humans, of course, 
Well, you ain't met no 200-year-old people, as we've often said. And the only difference between you and a fly is that you know about fly swatters, as we've often said before. And from a very young age, they were teaching you this ontological truth at the park when they said, get in the van, you gotta go. No, I don't wanna go, I wanna swing at the park. No, 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 you don't understand. You don't get to be at the park forever. You gotta go to the van. They were teaching you already an ontological truth, which of course the Greeks are going to spend a lot of time thinking about. What does it mean to say that we are mortal? What does it mean to say that we die? What happens to us when we die? What do you mean what happens to us? You decompose and you go back to the dirt. No, no, no. The Greeks are going to argue there's something else going on. There's this thing called spirit or soul, this, this breath that of course goes away. But what about your consciousness? Who you are? What, what's that all about? Well, these are all questions of course of ontology. We're going to be playing that game. Of course, this won't shock us, the question of theology, T-H-E-O, theo, meaning God, right? The study of God, gods, that is to say, ultimate reality. But for the Greeks, they also will spend a lot of time with the question of theodicy, right? T-H-E-O-D-I-C-Y, theo, God, D-K, the Greek word for justice. This is the question of evil in the world, suffering in the world, pain in the world. It's the question of... Why is it that sometimes stuff happens? I'm driving to work, I get rear-ended, all of a sudden I'm seriously injured. Uh, why is this happening? I mean, figure, this is going to be a Greek question. And the stories of that we'll be studying in the text mythology, these stories are going to be conflicted in their understanding. For example, if something bad happens to you, is it fate? Or is it the will of the gods? Is that the same thing? Can the gods control fate? Or is somehow fate sit a little bit above? That is to say the god weird. We're going to get into this conversation in our study. Finally, there's the question about morals and ethics. In other words, what's the right way to behave? And how does one know that? How can one be sure about the way one is supposed to act and behave? Now think about this. This is really a two-part question. First of all, an individual kind of understanding. What we today understand as psychology, the individual mind, right? And then there is what happens when you and I are together, sociology, or what we might call politics. In other words, it's one thing to hold a certain view for yourself, but it's a whole other idea to put two or three of your pals together and say, now this is the way we are going to behave, right? And of course, this is always going to be fundamentally some of the dynamic tensions that will occur in some of these stories. And by extension, of course, almost all the stories that we seem to consider most important in our literary tradition. I mean, I'll just give you a classic example as we finish. What about killing or sacrificing your child? Good idea, bad idea. Is it the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do? In our study of mythology, for example, of the Greeks and Romans, there will be the classic story of the sacrifice of Iphigenia, as it's called, right? Agamemnon wants to go away and go and fight in the war at the walls of Troy. He cannot do that until he sacrifices his own daughter. Well, what a um, barbaric thing to do. Well, yeah, but the gods seem to suggest that's the only way for Agamemnon to go forward. Of course, this notion of sacrificing your child is a notion that any biblical reader would understand as well. A story in the book of Judges chapter 11, Jephthah, the great judge of Israel, referenced by Shakespeare in Hamlet's, uh, in, in Hamlet's uh, exchange with Polonius. Uh, Jephthah, judge of Israel, what a daughter had he. Of course, in our study of Hamlet, we've given those lectures. That's a tension point. Of course, if you study Christian theology, the idea of a God the Father sacrificing the Son, that's fundamental to understanding Milton's theodicy in Paradise Lost, as we've said in earlier lectures from uh, the Harvard Classics. To that degree, I'm just giving this as one example of a thousand more that we could give, the Greeks are going to resurrect some interesting philosophic tension points for us. And, of course, those have not gone away, have they? For example, when a state or a nation sends off its young to go and fight in a conflict where the state or nation knows many of those young will die, is that a form of child sacrifice? 
Many pacifists, like Tolstoy and others, have argued, yeah, it is, and if you're going to send your children off to die, you better think long and hard about the values of why it is that you're doing this. Very interesting. So in other words, this is one example of attention that we will see. And as we get into this study, we want to be paying attention to all four of these dimensions of epistemology, ontology, the question of theodicy, why do bad things happen to quote-unquote good people and the like? And then finally, of course, the questions of ethics and morals and how we are to pay. And what does it mean to talk about an individual perspective, psychological, individual mind, versus the group, that is to say the sociological perspective? Well, let's turn now to our second lecture. And let's go ahead and get the major gods and goddesses out of the way, as Hamilton will outline them. And um, we'll do that here in a moment from part one, chapter one. I'm excited to enjoy this conversation and series of talks with you. Thank you.